treatment of MRSA. There recently was a new set of Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, replacing guidelines that were about eight years old. And I just want to point this out. These are the purulent skin and soft tissue infections, abscess in other words, which is usually MRSA in most areas of the United States. And on all varieties, whether they're mild, moderate, or severe, the number one step in treating MRSA is incision and drainage, number one, two, and three. But then when you get past that, you might consider culture and sensitivity, you might consider oral antibiotics, or oral or even parenteral antibiotics as the infection becomes severe. And they have new definitions for this mild, moderate, and severe. And you can see that moderate infection includes things like tachycardia, like a fever, tachypnea, a high white count. And severe infections are those who have failed routine or are those who are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, or who are literally hypotensive. And at that point, you don't go through series of steps. You go right to the IV parenteral drugs. And there are some new ones. This is the list of parenteral drugs currently approved in the United States for MRSA. These three are new. They were approved last year. And the reason they're interesting is they have a very, very long half-life. And because they have a very long half-life, they have very infrequent dosing schedules. Even a single dose or two doses are sufficient. Where is this important? If you have an MRSA patient, someone with a bad abscess, they may have a low-grade fever, or if you've checked their white count, their white count's 14,500, and you're not sure about their ability to be adherent to a prolonged administration of an oral agent, they can be sent to get one IV infusion or two, and it's done out of their hands, and you don't have to worry about it. These are expensive drugs, and they shouldn't be used lightly, but they do exist, we need to know about them, and for the right patient, they may make all the difference. And if you want the references, of course, they're the references for some of the newer drugs. Now, what about recurring MRSA? According to the Infectious Disease Society of America, you might consider decolonization with intranasal mupirocin. Jim already mentioned to you, there is resistant. Nationwide, the current figure for someone who's used mupirocin in the past is 13% are resistant. So MRSA may not be sensitive to that anymore. They may also and probably should use some antibacterial wash like chlorhexidine. That's because these organisms can be behind the ears. They can be particularly in the groin. And all their personal items need to be cleansed, a la the study I showed you, the environment as a reservoir. And you should also look for a source, a pet, a sex partner, family members, teammates if they're participating in sports. And even though they think this is low quality of evidence and considered a weak recommendation, they still did recommend it, and it still is appropriate for the right patients. Just remember bleach. Bleach is not harmless. Bleach needs to be diluted. These are children who are exposed for a short period of time to undiluted bleach. It's pretty striking, isn't it? Needs to be diluted a quarter to a half a cup per standard bathtub, not pure bleach. I had one patient who decided to wash themselves in pure bleach. Not a pretty sight. And the last thing I want to mention is that this is a global problem. It's not just the US. Five out of six of the World Health Organization reporting, they have regions, reporting regions, have over 50% of their staff isolates are MRSA. Over 50%. Five out of six reporting regions. So this is a worldwide problem with potentially really, really bad consequences. Do keep in mind, there may be different strains. That's why we classify them. And we can also do epidemiologic tracing and see where these strains are going, where they are becoming predominant. But for right now, this has been fairly stable for quite some time.